We serve a God who is always near. A God who enters into the messiness of life. We've been walking through uh, this spring, our, our spring series on the Psalms. And that is the title, right? Finding God in the messiness of life. Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 142. Psalm 142. If you do not have a Bible, there is a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. And we would love for you to take that and to make it your own as a gift from us. These next three weeks, we're going to be walking through. There are 13 psalms that have a, a subtitle, a little note of, that corresponds to where David was in a particular part in life. In these next three weeks, we're going to be looking at specific psalms that David wrote and the situation surrounding them, okay? And we're going to find that life was messy, and he cried out to God, and he found God. Uh, while we're at it, let me highly recommend to you uh, Chuck Swindoll's book and character study on the life of David. It's exceptional. It does so much to piece together the journey of faith that he walked through. So Psalm 142. Psalm 142. In honor of God's word, if you would please stand as I read. I'll be reading out of the New American Standard this morning. Yours probably has a subtitle like mine does, A Prayer for Help in Trouble. And then this is that subtitle, right? Uh, that says, when, when David was in the cave, a prayer. I cry aloud with my voice to the Lord. I make supplication with my voice to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare my trouble before him. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, you knew my path and the way where I walk. They have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see, for there is no one who regards me. There is no escape for me. No one cares for my soul. I cry out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Give heed to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring my soul out of prison so that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. You may be seated. Uh, would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, we do confess that oftentimes life is messy. It's filled with loneliness, times where we feel completely isolated as if we were on our own. Father, as we read through your word, as we hear about your servant David, as we picture how David mirrors your son, Jesus, the truth of the matter is, is that you are a God who enters into our mess. Father, I pray all across this room and those who are listening at home under the sound of my voice that as your word is proclaimed, that your Holy Spirit would reach into the depths of our soul and would bring comfort that only you can. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so picture with me one of the most memorable scenes in all of history. David is 17, and he has just slain Goliath. He stands over the slain nine-foot giant in victory. The Resounding proclaim is that God gives victory to the righteous. That is the refrain. David is instantly a national hero. Just imagine the parades and the acclaim. 1 Samuel 18, 6, when David returned from killing the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. The women sang as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David 
his ten thousands. He has talked about and recognized everywhere he goes. There he is. That's David. Do you see him? Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. And so David went out wherever Saul sent him and prospered. Saul sent him over, Saul set him over the men of war, and it was pleasing in the sight of all the people. Everything changes rapidly for David. He leaves his family, he leaves the shepherd's field for the palace. Suddenly, he is the commander of thousands. And as much as he feels unworthy, the honors and the accolades don't slow down. You see, this shepherd boy from nowhere has a new life. He has money. He has title. He has respect. He married King Saul's daughter. He is now the son-in-law of the king, his wife, Michael. He has fame. He has health. He is the darling of Israel. What could possibly go wrong? Chapters earlier, we are first introduced to David because King Saul has disobeyed God. And the Lord has promised that the kingdom would be removed from Saul. The Messiah would have been from his line. It would have been uh, King Saul's dynasty that we talk about to this day, but no longer. He has been disobedient. And so Samuel the prophet is told and to go find a young shepherd boy in Bethlehem and to anoint him as the next king, for he is one who is after God's own heart. Saul knows that the kingdom will be torn from him, but he doesn't know to whom. So when David bursts on the scene, Saul becomes suspicious. And quickly that turns into jealous rage where he will stop at nothing but to kill David. One evening, David is at his usual place in the palace. He's playing his harp for King Saul. When suddenly Saul picks up a spear and hurls it at him. David escapes, although pinned to the wall. And this occurred twice. Now listen to this. Now Saul was afraid of David For the Lord was with him, but he had departed from Saul. So catch this. David is the innocent king in waiting who has done nothing wrong to warrant the suffering that is about to come upon him. All he has done is courageously obeyed. He's won battles for king and country, and he's filled with the spirit of God. Pause there for a second, because when you ask the question, why did all the trouble that I'm about to unfold come upon him? At the end of the day, it is simply because he's filled with the spirit of God. And that is at complete odds with this world. You see, this is the beginning of an enormous breaking in David's life. He flees the palace after Saul tries to attack him. He flees the palace and he goes home to his wife, Michael. And that evening, she catches wind of an assassination attempt. So she lowers him out the window in the middle of the night. They will be separated for more than seven years. Family, time, Distance, nothing will ever be the same again. Their eyes lock for one final goodbye. He will always remember the smell of her hair, the way that her nose crinkled whenever she laughed. The plans of growing old together shattered in an instant. In one fell swoop, he's lost the love of his life 
along with his home, his source of income, and his position in the army. Suddenly, he is labeled a traitor, charged with treason, and is a fugitive on the run. While the king and his army are in constant pursuit. Where does David go? He flees and he finds Samuel. Samuel is a spiritual father to David, a mentor. Samuel anointed him and from that point forward had become a close friend. This father figure that he would lean on for strength. The two decide that they would go hide out in a large city as David tries to flee Saul. But these two are far too recognizable. And word comes back to Saul about where David is, and he must flee again. Gone is Samuel's assuring presence. David now, hiding in the woods, goes back to the palace in hopes to meet with his friend Jonathan to see if there is anything that Jonathan might be able to do on his behalf. Can he offer any assistance? You see, Jonathan is a great friend. In fact, he's the best friend that anyone could ever ask for. But the word comes back that David must escape again and never return. And the next time David will see his friend is his battle-torn corpse is all that remains. You see, David's life has become a horror. He says, there's hardly a step between me and death. Any who help him find the fury of the king. Saul had an entire village of priests slaughtered because they helped David find food and shelter for the night. The weight of death follows David. He's out of options. In desperation, he flees to Gath, which is the capital city of the Philistines. Right? The hated enemy of Israel. He flees there and goes to King Achish and says, uh, maybe I can be a special commander and do special operatives for you. But of course, David is immediately recognized. You know, someone taps the king on the shoulder. Oh, wait a second. Isn't this the one that they, they sang Saul killed his David, his 10,000s? Isn't this the one? Why is he here? So David panics in a desperation moment. And the scripture says he begins to pretend as if he's gone insane. He scribbled on the doors of the gate and let saliva run down into his beard. You see, all dignity is out of the window at this point. And it works He's unharmed and he escapes. And now, truly out of options. 1 Samuel 22 verse 1 says, He escaped to the cave of Adullam. How did the giant slayer get here? I mean, the national hero that every young boy wanted to be like. How did he get here? He's he's absorbed blow after blow, knocked down again and again. He's lost all plans and dreams that he had with his wife, a family, his position, his reputation, He's become an enemy of the state with a death warrant on his head, without Samuel, his mentor, without Jonathan, his best friend, carrying the weight of death, always looming behind him and losing even all self-respect as a man. He who courageously obeyed God and was filled with his spirit 
Here we find him alone in a cave in the blackest of nights. And for the first time, you see, he's just been on the run, on the run, on the run. And for the first time, as he enters the cave, the dust settles. He's allowed to collect his thoughts and he's allowed to survey the situation. And this is what he writes. For there is no one who regards me. There is no escape for me. No one cares for my soul. Has he become a curse? Forsaken by all, including God himself? There is no one who cares for my soul. Four quick points. You see, given what's happened in David's life, we certainly can understand and sympathize with this statement. There's no one who cares for my soul. But it's simply not true. It's untrue. When one walks into a dark room, it appears darker than what it actually is until our eyes adjust. You see, your suffering is unique to you and your circumstances and your perspective. No one else was raised in your home, suffered your losses in exactly the same way. And that, by nature, makes you feel alone. Who could possibly understand how you're processing? Not only that, what you've lost, what's been stolen from you, it demands to be heard. It screams, it cries out within you. And as you feel the weight of that burden, it's too much for your single pair of legs. You know, it's been said that depression is when the future looks darker than the past. And when the air's been knocked out of us, when we're gasping for that next breath, you can see it's hard to be real positive about the future. And it's in the midst of that isolation that your enemy, who wants to absolutely destroy you, sometimes whispers, but most of, uh, most of the time shouts. You're alone. There is no one that cares for your soul. But can I tell you the truth? That's a lie. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You are not alone. Listen to me. David was not alone. Michael. Michael. And Samuel did love him. They loved him. They did care what happened to him. They, they prayed for him every night. Jonathan will lay down his right to the throne for David. He sees. He says, I will give you my crown. In fact, in a short while, David's brothers his family will hear of all that's happened to him and they will come find him in the woods, in the cave. They will come find him and there will be a band of brothers that comes and will unite and will form an army and they will protect him. They will die for him. They will fight for him all the way up to the throne. They will make sure that he gets there. In fact, you see, God had promises for David. The future is actually very, very bright, even if his eyes are blinded by his current darkness. And you are not alone. All across this room and in this church are others who've lost children and spouses, battled cancer, 
picked up the pieces of a broken marriage. And hear me, we care. We care. I say that with everything inside of me. We offer you a shoulder to cry upon, a warm meal, encouragement, and someone to look at you and to declare the promises of God are better for you. There is a way forward. You may be saying, don't give me comfort, pastor. Give me answers. Okay, I want some answers. These next two things I'm about to say are for those who want answers. I'll give you the answers that we can glean from the scripture from David's life. So number two, God intentionally breaks David in order to build him back up. In himself, in Christ, in God. God intentionally breaks him down in order to build him up. To quote Chuck Swindoll, God is removing all crutches from his life so that there is nothing to lean upon except Jesus. Nothing to lean upon except Jesus. You see, even though David is already a man of integrity and courage and faith, God wants even more of him. Even more of him. You see, crutches become a substitute for God. And if God is allowing those crutches to be removed in your life, he's doing it so that you will lean upon him and trust him and him alone. See, our lives are filled with safety nets that give us a sense of security and comfort. But in reality, there is no safety net but God. Your job, savings, health, your loved ones are all subject to change. In fact, let me say it stronger to you, they will change. Your health will fail. Your job will eventually come to an end. And if you live long enough, you will experience the deep pain of loss. I'm not saying this to be bleak to you. I'm saying this to actually provide comfort because there is one reality that every one of us will face Jesus Christ, and stand face to face with him. Your life will come to that end. And he is your only hope, your only security. He is the only thing that is certain. It's why even in the darkest cave where David is, after every other crutch is removed, he can still find refuge in God. Verse 5. I cry out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Right? Whom have I in heaven but you? You are it. Number three, David is not fit to lead the people of God if all he's experienced are victories. All right, truthfully, you want answers? David is not fit to lead the people of God if all he's experienced are victories. If all he's known is the victory of defeating Goliath, what kind of leader is he going to be? He'll walk around, hey, you guys need to get your act together and be more like me. Okay? If you just trust God, God gives good things. So pick up a slingshot and let's start beating people up. That's all you're ever going to get from him. The Lord purposely uses broken vessels. Joseph needed the pit. Elijah to be chased by Jezebel's army. 
There's Gideon and Abraham waiting and waiting and waiting upon the Lord. And Jacob walked with a limp. I want to read for you a poem by Amy Carmichael titled, Has Thou No Scar? Has thou no scar? No hidden scar on foot or side or hand? I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascendant star. Has thou no scar? Has thou no wound? Yet I was wounded by archers spent. Lean me against a tree to die and rent. By ravening beasts that encompass me, I swooned. Has thou no wound? No wound, no scar? Yet as the master shall the servant be. And pierced are the feet that follow me. But thine are whole. Can he have followed far? Who has no wound or scar? You see, the reality is, is that trials are the very food of faith. And they make us more like our Savior. It's why James 1, 2 says, consider it all joy. Consider it joy when you encounter various trials, for this produces endurance. And when the endurance works itself, you will be made perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. You see, when David killed Goliath, he was on the top of a mountain. He thought it was great, as good as it could possibly be. But do you know that God actually had a bigger mountain for David? A bigger mountain. Greater promises still. He wanted to give him the kingdom. He wanted the Messiah to come from him. But in order to get from this mountain to this mountain... He had to go through the valley to get there. Kintsuji is the Japanese pottery, which means golden repair. Artists take broken, discarded pieces of pottery and repair them with a special golden lacquer, mending it back together again. See, the beauty of this pottery is it actually highlights the imperfections instead of hiding them. How many times do you piece something back together and want to just make it whole, pretend like the brokenness was never there, but instead this sees those cracks that they add to the beauty and should be celebrated. Listen to me. Jesus is a Kintsuji artist with our lives unashamedly turning brokenness back into beauty. Now, before I give you my final point, I need to pause and just let you know. All right, so so I've given two points of just, uh, tell me why, give me an answer. Okay, well, because God's working on your character and and if God's gonna shape you and God's gonna use you, you're gonna have to go through some tough times. But let me say this to you. In the years of being a pastor, of listening and hearing people's stories, more than anything, I find that when people object to God, it's because they have scars. It's not intellectually. It's because they have scars. And they are sitting in their own cave, in the darkness of their own situations and not being able to piece it together. They're confused about what happened to them and why did it have to happen and turn out such a way. And they have scars. Friend, I offer you the comfort of a savior with scars. David's sufferings set the pattern for the sufferings of the coming King Jesus. There is a pattern, there are parallels that are in David's life that become types and patterns and shadows foreshadowing the suffering King who is to come. As I narrated the story, I hope you picked up on some of these patterns that he who was the anointed king in waiting suffered unjustly. 
The national hero is hated and hunted by those in power, narrowly escaping capture time and time again. The completely innocent one is falsely accused of treason while his name and reputation are being slandered. All of this resulting in immense suffering. Abandoned by all. Utterly alone. Physical, emotional, and spiritual suffering. Why do you need to see this pattern? Well, because David came a thousand years before Jesus. A thousand years. This this is the way that the the Old Testament predicts the coming of Jesus. This is the absolute magnificence of how you know there is one author of Scripture. His name is God. He is eternal. And he wrote this whole thing out. Because I can show you pattern upon pattern upon pattern of these types and these pictures and how they point towards Jesus. And this one is the suffering psalmist David who sits alone in a cave, who's the anointed innocent king who is suffering upon suffering upon suffering a thousand years prior. Why does that matter? Because you need to know the kind of God that he is. That when he comes, what is he going to be like? What is his allotment in life? Is he a relaxed, uh, carefree carpenter? A juvial entrepreneur of a businessman? A pampered silver spoon? Man of sorrows. What a name for the son of God who came. He is acquainted with our grief. When you get a snapshot of picture, when you read Hebrews 4 and 5, it says not only is he able to sympathize with our weaknesses, but rather that he learned to be obedient, that God was preparing him for the suffering of his final days on the cross, that God had prepared him for 30 plus years with deep, deep, Suffering, crying, wailing, crying out to God. In those silent years. Again, why does that matter? Because as you sit. In your cave. With your scars feeling utterly alone. Listening to the cries of the enemy that say there is no one who cares for your soul. Scripture says, the King of kings and the Lord of lords rendered the heavens took on flesh, suffered more than any human in all of history, was born in the cave, was laid in a cave as his grave so that he might enter your cave and sit next to you. And say, I know. I know. I understand. The scarred Savior is the only one to wipe every tear from your eye. And bring the healing that your soul deeply longs for. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, King Jesus, 
We cry out to you right now. Thank you, Jesus, that you have entered into my mess that you know my every thought, that you understand everything that I've ever gone through. And your heart is filled with compassion, that you long to be my comforter, that your pierced hands wipe my every tear. King Jesus, all across this room, Would you enter into the darkest caves of our hearts? And would you bring life? Would you bring life and healing? Would you be the lifter of heads? Would you put your arm around the deepest, deepest hurts? All the questions all the longings as only you can. Jesus, we loved you because you first loved us. We pray all of this in your holy name. Amen.